Thank you, everybody. <laughs> you are very, very kind, and I'm really grateful to have this opportunity today to be here. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's Christmas, and, and just like every year, we face challenges to Christmas worship. I mean, one of the main ones is that um, the images and the that the ideas of Christmas are so familiar and they're so laden with sentimental value that they can easily kind of hijack our heart and send it down a purely emotional track. I mean, they can, they can capture our, our, our attention so that we really miss the essential message of Christmas. So that may, that's hopefully not happening, doesn't seem to be this morning, but that's one challenge. The other challenge is a little more contemporary challenge to worshiping Christmas, and that's what I call pick and choosism. Um, you know what I mean? Well, people today want to keep their options open, right? Um, especially their spiritual and religious options open, right? Rather than commit to specific beliefs, they want to keep the, uh, they want to just keep the, the sort of suspense. They want to keep the suspense up. Maybe it's the daily barrage of consumer options that can continually besiege us, um, asking for choices. Uh, maybe it's the rising distrust that people feel uh, against uh, traditional or established institutions and people in power. But whatever it is, it has spawned, has spawned a strong inclination to remain undecided. You know, to keep an open mind to whatever else might be out there. Um, there's, you know, they're, 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 they're hoping, that they're, they like the range of choices, but they aren't willing really to make a choice. Ever, does, that, does that come into view for, so certainly our culture, I'm not necessarily talking about us in the room, but I'm talking about our culture. Um, there's a growing number of surveys, I'm sure you've heard about them, that reveal that the number of nuns, the people who do not affirm any religious affiliation, is on the rise in our country. Maybe that's evidence of pick and choosism. Many Americans consider themselves vaguely spiritual, but hold few, if any, specific beliefs. Well, that's a challenge, right, to Christmas worship. So, for two reasons. The message of the real message of Christmas is harder and harder to hear, right? On the one hand, it, it, Christmas, the message of Christmas is unsettling. It's emotionally unsettling. It's not a cozy, comfortable, you know, let's just sort of wallow or, or let's just sort of rest into it message. That's not the kind of message Christmas is. And on the other hand, it directly presents an either or reality, right? I mean, it's either true as a belief or it's false, but it's not whatever you want it to be, right? Christmas is not just, well, a little of this, a little of that, maybe this, maybe that. That's, that's kind of the way I think that our culture would prefer to see it, but it's an either or reality. Either Christ the Savior is born, and that's true, or he wasn't, and it isn't. And, and, and a choice then, you know, has got to be made. So today, because of those challenges, I want us to just take a few moments to refocus on the essential meaning, reality of Christmas. I, wanna, I want us to hopefully recapture that and maybe feel it with renewed power. And, uh, and so we're going to do that today. We're going to look at the scripture about Christmas. But you know, before we do that, and because this is actually the last sermon that I will preach as a pastor of Calvary Sunday. I hope it's not the last sermon I preach here. That's certainly possible up to Pastor Dan, but I, I, I'm sure that we'll have such opportunities in the future. But as a pastor here on staff, my last sermon. So I want to take a few minutes just to, to thank you. Everybody in this room and everybody who's maybe online and of course people from generations past that aren't here with us. Um, I'm just so grateful to have been here at Calvary Assembly. You know, I, I did a little calculation this week, and I, I tried to total up, I didn't do it carefully, but I estimated the number of times that I have preached or taught here at Calvary Assembly, and it's, it's well over 1,500 times. 
and uh, that's quite a few. Um, but and I'm hopeful that that preaching had some effect on the congregation. But I can tell you for a fact that the discipline of preaching has shaped my worldview, has heightened my passions for God and for his people, has completely shaped my life. And I am grateful to have had that opportunity. I'm grateful that you stuck around and listened. That's pretty good. Um, and, and, you know, I, I also want to thank you, um, families here at Calvary Assembly, for receiving me into your life at some of life's most momentous occasions, right? I mean, I had the privilege of joining, uniting some of you together in marriage. I had the privilege of, 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 really, I call it that, a privilege of grieving with, with some of you as at the loss of fathers and mothers and siblings and friends. Those are privileges. Uh, I've had the privilege of counseling you, uh, you know, in the midst of uh, troubles without and fears within. I've had that privilege. I've gotten, and you've invited me in to do that. And then, of course, the best thing maybe is the, just the countless opportunities, just enjoying uh, conversations, enjoying uh, praying together, encouraging one another, singing together, praying together, serving together. I think of our team that went to Alaska this summer, and I, those are, and, and the many teams we've taken over the years, what, what a privilege just to be together. I'm grateful. I'm really and truly grateful for those opportunities. And, and you know, Patricia and I, I, I know I can speak for my wife, are deeply grateful for the way that you have received and encouraged and cheered on our entire family, my, my, myself and, and my wife and our kids. And, uh, you know, we have, we have just been so blessed uh, by that. And, you know, I want to say this. It would be, it's just a raw, it's just a solid fact that my ministry here at Calvary Assembly would have been completely impossible, a complete, a, a complete bust, were it not for the grace and steady love and wise counsel of my lovely wife, and lifelong partner, Patricia. Amen. <laughs> I, guess, I guess you can guess, but nobody probably knows except those inside a pastoral family that it's a two-person deal, right? Pastor Dan and Bridget know this really, really well. So, dear, I love you. I know you love me. Thank you so much. <laughs> And I want to thank my kids. Um, you know, the reality is that they have borne with, they have uh, put up with, and, and endured gracefully, actually, all the many intrusions that pastoral, make, pastoral ministry makes into family life. And uh, they've been there all along the way. I, I can say this factly. They've, they've loved, and they've respected me, and they've encouraged me to be a good father and a good pastor. And I'm really, really grateful. <laughs> and, you know, scores and scores of people have served Calvary Assembly over the years. Um, just way too many to mention. But, you know, you've got worship leaders. You've got, of course, uh, deacons. You've got trustees. You've got Sunday school teachers, nursery workers, ushers. Uh, you know, just every role you can think of, people have come alongside. And I, and, I, and I know that only the Lord knows the sacrifices you made, but I want to affirm you for what I've seen of dedication to the Lord and to his people. Thank you for your dedication to what he's doing here and has been doing here at Calvary Assembly for the last quarter century. Amen? And, you know, I got to say one, there's one more group that I got to thank, and that is at least one more group, probably many more. But the, those that have served on, on staff with me over the years, I mean, I, I don't know, a dozen maybe, a couple dozen people, um, it's been a delight to serve Jesus together, um, to grow together, to sweat together, to some, certainly pray together, to weep together at times. Um, and, and I am so deeply grateful to have been able to watch every single one of them love the Lord, grow in the Lord, grow in their skill in ministry, grow in their passion for God's people. That's a pleasure and a privilege, and I'm grateful. 
And of course, it goes without saying, I suppose, but I'll say it nevertheless, that I am grateful for one particular partner in ministry very much. A person who, the only person uh, who has been with me here every single minute of my ministry at Calvary Assembly, and that's, and that's Pastor Dan, of course. <laughs> Because I, am, I have been blessed by his steady, faithful, fruitful, utterly trustworthy partnership in ministry. And I'm amazed, actually, the truth is. I mean, how many times, how many people can work together for 25 and a half years and say it's been good? Hallelujah. Well, we can say it. And I am grateful. <laughs> well... Everything good that we've experienced at Calvary Assembly, as has already been said, has come out of our devotion to Jesus Christ. Has, been, has come out of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? It's because we've embraced a greater cause than just ourselves, right? We've chosen to love in su and to, to live and to love and to serve in such a way as to honor the Lord. As you know, right, our, our mission statement, I hope you know, but... If you don't, come to next steps. Um, but, you, but it's this. Our mission is to wholeheartedly love God and people so that others will love God too. Very simple, but I think profound. And it's what makes us tick. That's who we are. And, and of course, that great cause keeps us going. And it's that great cause, right, that was launched on the day Jesus was born. So that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. We want to get a fresh look at his birth. So turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to read together verse 18 through 25. It's the, it's the account of Jesus' birth that Matthew gives us. And uh, let's read it together. You can read along with me. So this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, this passage, as you can already know, reveals uh, you know, some, the substance of Christ's birth, right? The purpose for his coming. And it also reveals a little bit of the dynamics of Jesus' life and ministry. And, uh, and to show us these things, this, the, the, this passage puts the spotlight on three things. God's man, God's mission, and God's method. That's what we're going to take, take a look at. So, you know, God invites a man, Joseph, right? God initiates a mission. We're going to see what that is. And God um, instigates a method. He reveals a method of rescue. We're going to take a look at those three things. So, first of all, God's man. Take a look. Think about Joseph. You know, Jesus came into Joseph's life just before Joseph was about to sweep him out of his life, right? I mean, Joseph got wind, right, of Mary's pregnancy. Now, we don't know whether that was Mary who told him or whether it was just a Nazareth grapevine, but when Joseph got this message, you know it shocked him. You know it, 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 it knocked him for a loop, right? shook him up, and, and, and Joseph was a law-honoring Jewish man. And that's what the Jewish faith taught, and that's what he was. Now, if Joseph had strictly adhered to the law, any strict adherence to the law would have what? 
would have required some sort of punishment for Mary, or at very least, it would have prescribed that Joseph divorce her, divorce himself from her. And, uh, and, and that's just kind of the way it would have been. Joseph would have had a lot of support if he did that. I mean, that's what was expected. That's what the, the, the surrounding culture would have, would have advised. And uh, like all the patriarchal cultures of the ancient world, and, and like some that still exist uh, today, fathers, had, fathers and husbands had very clearly defined roles and expectations. What were they? Well, uh, they were expected to provide materially for their families. That was the father's job. And, and they were given the right and they, the, 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 the right to direct and plan the entire future of the family. And, and in fact, is they were allowed, often, they were allowed a strong dose of emotional detachment from their wives. They were, they were the boss. They were the Lord. They were free to do as they pleased. And it was up to them and them alone. So it, it's not uncommon for men in cultures like that, it wouldn't have been uncommon for Joseph, to become rigid and overbearing in his leadership, to resist and to resist unconventional ideas, particularly if they came through his wife. But Joseph wasn't like that. Joseph wasn't either a legalist or an excessively domineering patriarch. Joseph didn't buy into the legalism that was common, common of the day, and he wasn't a domineering uh, husband. Instead, what? He offered Mary respect and dignity, didn't he? Right? He wanted to protect her. He offered her a way to escape the consequences of what he presumed at that point to be her misbehavior. So, here's what he did. Verse 19 again. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose Mary to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. He found a way to protect her dignity. The Bible says Joseph acted with a genuine, God-certified kind of righteousness. We use that word, sometimes it has a terribly negative connotation, but for Joseph it looks beautiful, doesn't it? That's the kind of righteousness God has in mind when he says, oh, you know, be righteous. So, when the angel of the Lord came to Joseph in a dream, right, and Joseph's heart was primed to receive God's message. He was, he was, he was an open-hearted man. He was open to the word of God, despite its unconventional instructions, right? I mean, in effect, the angel says this, put your fears aside, Joseph, and take for yourself a wife of a woman who's pregnant with a child that's not your own. And Joseph says, because it's God speaking, okay. Okay. I'm open. God can tell me to do something very unconventional. Something I can't even comprehend. He must have sensed God's authority in the angel's message. So he quickly dismisses his previous plans and he humbly submits because Joseph recognized the voice of God, the authority of God, the truth of God. Now, you know, if you want a model of biblical manhood, you can pull out David, you can pull out Samson, you can pull out the mighty warriors of the Bible, but I'd like to pull out Joseph. Amen? Why? Because he's a humble man, yet he's firm in his convictions, right? He's submissive to God, but he's resistant to the prevailing cultural values that might have uh, taken him away from God's plan and purpose. Someone with a more legalistic mind than Joseph had would have found it impossible to respond as Joseph did. I mean, they would have thought that this, this message from the angel was either heresy or a hallucination. They would have just said, ah, oh, I can't handle that. It, it contradicts the law. And, but Joseph knew God's character better than that. He knew God and recognized his voice and worship the lawgiver ahead of the law. Amen? And as we know what happened, right? Joseph is going to lead his family. And he's going to lead his family through the dangers of Mary's journey to Bethlehem, ready to give 
give birth and he's going to lead the family through the dangers of, you know, all the discomforts, I should say, of, of that birth and the difficulties surrounding it. And then he's going to lead the family to safety when Herod threatens this child and later when Archelaus does the same. Joseph stands up as a man who knows how to serve God and take care of his family. He's apparently, evidently, the kind of man that God can entrust with a big challenge. I think, in other words, he's a biblical man. Amen? He's the man that God chose to raise his own son. I guess he qualifies. And I think the truth is, this is still the kind of man to whom God will entrust challenges in our world. This is the kind of man God wants. So I want to ask you this, men. Are you swayed by the prevailing culture um, or are you directed by the word of God? You know, are you listening more to the wind and waves that, 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 that blow through our culture? They blow. They don't, just, they don't just gently breeze. They blow through our culture. Or are we tuned in to the word of God? Because, because that's how Joseph was. And I think he's a great model. All right? And do we fear the scorn of other people? Or do we fear and live humbly with the living God? That was Joseph. Our future and the world's future, I believe, really hinges on those kind of men. May God help us. Amen? Amen. So God's man and God's mission. Joseph submitted himself to God, received not only a wife and a family, but a revelation about the mission that this Savior was going to carry out. We read it, but here's what it is. You are to give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. God, in giving Jesus this name, defines what Jesus is going to do. You know that the name uh, Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew word Joshua, which means the Lord saves. Jesus is given that name because that's his job. That's the, and God, of course, assigns it. doesn't let Joseph name him. God names him, and God keeps that authority, and in fact, he signifies his, mess, his mission, I mean. Um, he's the Savior. And he's come to rescue sinners. Jesus says this over and over and over again. He's come to save sinners. Now, this mission would have made perfect sense to Joseph, right? He lived in a world. Uh, he would readily agree that salvation from sin was an urgent, pressing need. That's the way he thought. Today, however, modern people wonder, who needs to be saved anyway? Right? Right? I mean, that's, I would say, a pretty fair assessment of at least the prevailing modern American culture. Who needs to be saved anyway? Um, in fact, I would say it's, you can go so far as to say that the only thing from which many modern people think they need to be saved are people who believe they need to be saved. They need to be, they need to be, they need to be saved from the opinion that they need to be saved and those who hold it. Sin, at least in that, by that name, is really not taken terribly seriously, right? God's been kind of pushed aside, out of sight, out of mind. And modern people don't then feel a very serious duty to honor and obey or uh, serve God, live up to his standards. Um, you, you, how many times have you ever heard a person in our culture by a contemporary voice be praised as a God-fearing person? Not anymore. It's just not the way we are. So, but it's funny. Uh, that's true. You know, sin's kind of out. Um, so being saved from sins not really make, makes a lot of sense. But strangely enough, modern people still find themselves captive. Captive to, I would say, their own ambitions, which can easily become their obsessions. People desire fullness, right? So they latch onto the means of gaining fulfillment. They do whatever they can to find fulfillment. So wealth, career success, marrying Mr. and Mrs. Wright, fame, power, all these things become their, their, their controlling, their ultimate aims, their, their ambitions, which become then obsessions, their driving passions. These things, which are many of them, by the way, good when kept in balance, just go out of balance. And when they're out of balance, they become masters. 
they become slave drivers and so modern people may not use the world's word sin but they sure wrestle with it do we agree I mean sure so people are willing to become servants to these ultimate aims right so they and and these ultimate aims whether there's career maybe demands the sacrifice of health and family or the sacrifice you might sacrifice integrity to gain wealth or power you might sacrifice truthfulness to gain political position these are the dynamics of sin even if they don't have the name of sin right and Jesus came to save people from sin from being obsessed, gripped, and, and, and captivated by life-destroying lords, life-destroying gods. The good news is, he is the one Lord whom you can serve and not be eaten up, not be swallowed up. You can serve Jesus and he will not eat you alive, amen? <laughs> that is a good thing. And uh, he's the one Lord who will actually fulfill our deepest longings. You love Jesus and you will find life is satisfying. And he's the one Lord who actually sets his people free. Amen. So after revealing his mission, that's the mission of the Lord, God's mission. Uh, Joseph, or I'm sorry, Matthew cites one single verse that sums up God's entire method for fulfilling this message. And, and, and you read it, but I'll read it once again. Matthew 1.22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So we're going to look really closely at just one word. It's one word, Emmanuel, which in English is three words, God with us. And we're going to look at it in just three ways, right? We're going to look at it as emphasizing God with us, and then God with us, and then God with us. Because that's his method. That's God's method for rescuing the world. Okay? First of all, God with us. The foundational reality of Christmas, which has got to, we got to blast through all the challenges, this. God became human. God took on human form. Uh, right from the very beginning, of course, the, uh, the, the reality, first chapter, first book of the, of the New Testament, re reveals to us that Jesus is God. What's Christmas all about? The creator of the universe, the omnipotent, almighty God becoming human. And all the other themes, Pastor Dan said this earlier, all the other secondary themes, the wonderful themes, peace on earth, reconciling alienated people, right? Sacrificial service, justice on earth, all of them flow out of this foundational truth that Jesus is God. Without Jesus God, you don't have the effects and impacts of Christianity. So, Christ Scripture reveals this truth over and over again. Um, we can't avoid it. Now, this is kind of where you get, you run into that sort of irritating exclusivity of Christianity. Right? I mean, we say that there is a Savior and there is only one Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, people often there, you know, kind of accuse Christians of being narrow-minded. Narrow-minded and, and just, uh, you know, insular, exclusive. Well, no doubt there are Christians who adopt uh, that belief and attach to it, a, you know, a sort of negative attitude. We know the truth. You don't get with it. You know, that's, a, that's not a good Christian attitude, in case you're wondering. Um, uh, and, but I don't think that's really what's going on. It, it is not narrow-minded, nor, nor does it require that attitude to simply say, the truth that Jesus is Lord is true. That's not narrow-minded. That's submitting to the facts. That's submitting to what is revealed and in many ways demonstrated and we, adequately proven, I suppose, wrong word, adequately verified in the scriptures. Saying that, believing that, is holding a matter of fact, is holding a, a perspective, is holding, yes, a, di a particular diagnosis about the needs and realities and, 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 and actualities of the world in which we live. 
But asserting it is not necessarily narrow-minded. It's simply, it's simply holding to the truth. All right. So, um, all right. What does, so, so, so we're going to say that. Jesus Christ is God. <laughs> and we're not narrow-minded to say that. But where does the Bible say that? Well, where we've looked already, I think this Matthew 1 is a passage where it does. But you can think of others, lots of others, right? John 1, 1. Uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, in context, that's strictly what it's saying. Jesus is God. And uh, you can go on, right? Uh, Jesus did a number of things that made it clear that he thought it was going to be behaved as if he were God. He saw himself, understood himself to be the son of God. Um, for instance, uh, a, paralytics were brought to, a paralytic was brought to Jesus and dropped through the roof of a house and Jesus looks at the man and before he ever pronounces healing on him, he says to him, and we read this in the scriptures, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I mean, the people in the room, the Pharisees in the room said, blasphemy, what are you doing? And of course, other people in the room might have said, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, this man didn't sin against you, and you know, right? Um, so how are you saying this? I mean, just think about forgiveness, right? I mean, if Jim punches Joe in the nose, and I walk into the room and say, Jim, I forgive you, Everybody's going to say, well, what are you doing? You can't forgive Jim for punching Joe. You know, the only person who can forgive Jim for punching Joe is Joe. Joe can forgive Jim. You can't forgive Jim. Because you can only forgive someone who sinned against you. And that must be what's going on with the paralytic. That Jesus is forgiving him his sins against him. Jesus is essentially saying all sins against another human are sins against God. And as the Son of God, I forgive you. Jesus certainly saw himself as, the, as able to forgive sins, and only God can forgive sins, right? And Jesus accepts worship appropriate to God. Jesus is God. He accepts worship appropriate. I mean, every time that God appears to great people in the Bible, to Daniel, to John the Apostle, you know, they, 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 they oh, I'm sorry, wrong. Every time an angel shows up, this is what I mean, an angel shows up to one of these guys, they, they, they are amazed. They're, they're awed at this great and glorious being. And they bow down to worship, and the angels always say to them, get up, buddy. Don't worship me. I'm just another creature like you are. Worship God and God alone. Worship God and God alone. And that's, you know, that's sort of, sort of basic. But when Jesus, well, when Thomas comes to Jesus after the resurrection, you know, Thomas, reluctant Thomas, doubting Thomas, um, doesn't want to believe, sees Jesus, however, some days later after the first apostles do, sees him, touches his wounds, re believes he's alive. And, and John, Thomas' response is, my Lord and my God. He bows in worship before Jesus. And Jesus doesn't say, no, 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 don't do that. Instead, he receives it. He welcomes it. He allows it, right? Jesus receives the worship of people because he is God. And not only did he claim to be God, but the persons who walked with Jesus believed that he was God, right? Jesus' face-to-face -face followers believed that he was God, and all of them were Jews. And there were no people in the world less likely than Jews to ever believe that a human could be God, right? I mean, Jews believed in an uncreated creator, a creator who is greater than all the universe, who spoke it into being, who had unlimited, infinite power and majesty and might, and it was blasphemy for a Jew or anyone to claim to be God. No human could be God. There were Jews, of course, who claimed to be Messiah, but they weren't claiming to be God. They were claiming to be one or another of the Messiah. However, when a, if a Jew were to make this claim, it would be total blasphemy. Um, they were Jewish people. How in the world did they come to believe 
that he was the son of God. And not only were they Jewish, but they actually lived with him. Now, if I wanted to convince somebody that I was God, the last people that I would start with would be my family. Because <laughs> they know all my imperfections. I won't ask them to recount them. Please, please. But I mean, that's exactly who, you know, the Lord is. The, the very first people who affirmed their faith in Jesus as the Son of God were the people he lived with day after day. How in the world did that happen? How did Jews who lived with Jesus come to believe that he was the Son of God? And by the way, that's very strong evidence that, that something real was going on here. Well, they must have seen Something in Jesus, a moral glory, a majesty, an unmatched greatness, something supernatural, something divine that enabled them to say, what I see matches the claims he makes. Why, why this is unbelievable, but it's true. This man is the son, is God the son. I mean, just think of the kind of person Jesus was, right? I mean, he confounded scholars, yet he was, yet he was able to be with the humble and the simple, right? Um, he, he trusted no one, yet he served everyone. I mean, Jesus was this incredible combination of humility and greatness, right? And when they looked at that, they must have concluded, well, first of all, they, they asked often, who is this? What are we seeing? And they ultimately concluded, we are seeing God, the Son, right? Now, believing that is either true or false. You're either, you know, he, they, could, they could only believe a couple things about Jesus. I mean, either he's crazy or he's a liar, or he is who he says he is. And they came to that, that conclusion. They believed he was God. And of course, you know what they did. They died for that belief, right? God with us. And here's the, that, that's the hard part of the message, by the way. That's the sharp edge. But here's the soft part. God with us. Hallelujah. God, this great God, this glorious, majestic, almighty God, has taken on human form. He's shrunk, he's brought himself down into human form, become one of us, entered our realm, and become accessible to us. Hallelujah. Amen. And you got to know that up until this point in history, up before Jesus, every time God appeared to humans, his appearance was terrifying. It was, re it was, it was something from which you had to flee, and, and, and that was certainly true of Job, right? When God appears to Job, he appeared as a whirlwind, and I had to choose this example because we know exactly what a whirlwind is. This week, we've seen tornadoes of incredible force and that's how jo God appears to Job as a tornado I mean I, 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 isn't it amazing to be I, I saw one news report this week of a young mom with two toddlers um, heard the tornado approaching placed her toddlers in the bathtub leaned over them to protect them and was completely shocked when, in a matter of only seconds, the house around them disappeared, the, the tub was lifted up and torn out of her hands, and the toddlers floated away. Now, thankfully, they survived. But can you imagine the terror of hearing those sounds, of seeing that, and watching your toddlers carried away in a tornado for a few feet? I mean, that's overwhelming terror. And that's exactly what Job felt when he saw God. It's a tornado. Or when, Moses, or when Moses saw God, when God appeared to him as a pillar of fire, a burning pillar of fire. When Israel, when God appeared to Israel, he appeared as a, a glory cloud so overpowering the priests couldn't do their service in the temple or in the tent. And, and even Moses, who probably better than anyone in the Old Testament was able to approach God in some way, when he sees God, he is told by God, you can't see my face and live, so you can see only my back. And yet when he sees just the back of God, his faith takes on a glow that when he comes down from the mountain and people see the glow on Moses' face, they're so frightened he has to cover it up. Getting close to God before Jesus was terrifying. 
And here's the amazing good news. No longer is that true. Oh, yes, he's still God. Oh, he's still terrible, awesome, mighty, majestic, and righteous. But he has revealed himself in the, in, in the Son of God, who, clothed in human flesh, is accessible. Amen? Amen. Oh, thank God. And so here's how the Bible describes it. We're closing. The word of God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only who came from the Father. Full of grace and truth. Do you realize what Moses would be saying to us if he heard the Christmas message? Moses would be saying something like this. Do you realize what this means? What I was forever forbidden from enjoying, what I could never access, you can access. You can approach the living God now that he's revealed in flesh. How are you not energized by this? How are you not excited by this? How are you not dazzled by this? Get with it, Moses would say. <laughs> This is stunningly good news. It is the most stunning possible good news. So it's God with us. And God with us, lastly. Not with all, just with us. Who is the us? Is it some, soup, some really exclusive group of super moral people who just really got everything together? No. Thank God. You know it was. It's the people who accepted Jesus' invita God's invitations. People like Joseph. People are just an ordinary, honest man who humbles himself and submits when he, when he learns what God wants him to do. Just that kind of response is the, are the people who God is with. He's with the shepherds, right? The outcast shepherds. He's not with the, 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 the king, but with the shepherds. People who come to God without references, without, without high and mighty pretenses, without a whole list of accomplishments that they can lay before him and say, look how hard I've worked, look how good I've been, look what I've done for you. People who come like that are not the people who are the us. The us are the people who come simply saying, I have nothing. I, I, I am unworthy. I don't deserve. And those are the ones he welcomes in. Hallelujah. God wants people without justifications, without all their accomplishments, just to come with nothing. And he always accepts them. That's good news because that's us, right? That's every human that's ever worked, lived. And praise God if we're among those who can acknowledge it. So I wrap up by this. It's always the shepherds who have who come, and it's what has been given to the shepherds, given to us? Well, the good news is God has dignified our humanity, even our flesh and blood, by becoming one of us. We have incredible dignity because God became a man, number one. Number two, we have incredible comfort in suffering in knowing that, that God himself has suffered as we have, such that when we enter suffering, we're never alone. He's been there before us. He sympathizes with us. He can console and carry us through it. Amen? And lastly, maybe best of all, we have tasted, or we can taste, the unbelievable depth of the love of God. God loved us so much that he changed his very being, altered the form of his being, took on human form so that he could save us. That's beautiful news. So what's this? The very best possible message the world can hear. Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Will we believe it today? Will we live it? Will we love it? And let the world see a difference because of it. Would you pray with me? Let's stand. Well, Lord, it's an amazing message. It's just too big for our minds. 
It's, it's, it's massive. It's grand. It's great. And the very best of all, God is with us. Lord, enable us, please, then, to see uh, past the comforting images on Christmas cards to the reality to which they point. Enable us, Lord, to, yes, make a choice to choose to believe this incredible good news. You are Lord. You are God. And in that, we thank you, Lord, for the dignity and the comfort in suffering and the amazing assurance we have that you love us. That you have loved us with an inconquerable love and that nothing ever can separate us from it. So Lord, grant these things this Christmas season, this Christmas week, may we worship and adore Christ the Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen and amen, Pastor Dan.